Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see you again. So today we proceed with uh, lecture number three. We will discuss about the impact of digital technologies on traditional businesses. Last week, uh, we introduced the concept of e-commerce and e-business, where we saw that e-business involves application of technology, in particular information technology, in carrying out business processes. Where e-commerce, we say it involves buying and selling online, as well as pre-sale and after-sale activities. And we also saw that depending on the degree of digitization, there are different forms of organization. We still, we have a virtual organization or pure play organization that conduct all their processes online. We also saw organizations that are doing part of their business online and part of it offline. And also we still have brick and mortar organizations that are completely offline. So today we are going to look at the impact of digital technologies on traditional businesses. So, as we said last week, just as it was in the, during Industrial Revolution, the digital revolution has also affected almost every aspect of our lives, whether it's in education, sports, healthcare, entertainment, uh, you name it. Almost there is no aspect of life that today has not been affected by digital evolution. The digital te technologies from social media, mobile computing, big data, internet of everything, they have all transformed the businesses. And this transformation differs from sector to sector. Just as, as it was in the industrial revolution where not all the uh, manufacturing or industries were affected by it at the same time, we know that during industrial revolution it was mostly the textile industry that adapted to the new technologies then faster than other industries. So likewise, in this digital revolution, different uh, sectors respond to the changes differently. Some of them are ahead of the game, others are still lagging behind. Just like in marathon, some are running faster, others are a bit slower, but we're all moving. So some people saw it so early. This is a quote from the chairman of Intel. This is one of the early adapters of e-commerce. He said it in 1996, so early, that the internet is a typhoon force, a time, 10 times force. Or is it a bit of windy? Or is it a force that fundamentally alters our business? So some people saw it so early and they started readjusting their business strategy to respond to the changes that were coming then. But however, Increasingly, more businesses are recognizing the benefits of digital technologies. And because of that, they are now undertaking what we call digital business transformation. So what is digital, uh, transform uh, digital business transformation? In the first lecture, I said, in order to create value, organizations employ different resources. And these resources are combined through activities to produce goods and services that customers uh, will be willing to pay for. So digital business transformation refers to the significant changes of the organization processes, structures, systems to improve the organization performance through increasing use of digital media and te uh, technology platforms. So simply you can say it's, uh, it's involved changes in the structures of an organization, processes, the entire system in order to, Im to improve the performance of the organization by applying digital technologies. There are two key opportunities of digital transformation. These are inbound marketing 
and more mobile marketing. We are discussing these two first because these are the opportunities that are open to any kind of business, whether it's a micro business, a small business, or a large corporation. All of them can take advantage of these opportunities. So I will start with inbound marketing. We all know that today's customer has a completely different decision-making process when it comes to purchasing. We have so many sources of information that we can use before we make purchasing decisions. So you could consult your friends or family. You could get information from television. But we could also get information online or in social media platforms, reading customer reviews of people that bought a service or a, a good previously, re checking ratings. But, but we can also consult the print media, such as newspapers, magazines. But sometimes you can, you can even consult a physical store, uh, the brick and mortar store. So for instance, you have seen a t-shirt or some Jack and Jones uh, jacket and you like it, but you're not quite sure if it looks good on you. You can run downtown to one of the Jack and Jones stores. Of course, that I'm not doing that, but people do it. You go inside and try it. If it look, uh, look at yourself, and if you think it's good, because buying online is much cheaper than buying in a physical store, you eventually can buy it online. So there have been a lot of complaints, especially uh, among the retailers in the United States, that this behavior has become so rampant that people are trying things in the physical store, but eventually they buy it online. Of course, I, if you're a business person, by having both online stores and physical stores, you can somehow take advantage of both. So if, if you're, say, L shop, they are selling electronic uh, appliances, it's okay. People can go and look at it physically, get a direct uh, feel of it, and eventually buy it from L shop. But uh, of course, it, it may happen that there is another online retailer that offers the same product at a lower price. And then you cannot do anything about that. Is you lose the sale. You, you need to re-examine your strategy. But at least the main point is that there are so many channels of information that today we have that aid our decision-making process. This phenomenon where there are numerous channels of information that consumers can use for uh, making their decision, Google has named it zero moment of truth that the phenomenon that involves multiple channels of information. So it could be through searching in the, say, search engine, reviewing ratings, looking at styles, comparing pri uh, prices uh, among different uh, service providers, and different, uh, different sources of information. All of these together is what Google has called a zero moment of truth, that we know so much that our decision-making process has become a lot more easier. So this new uh, approach of uh, marketing takes advantage of consumers' proactive behavior because the traditional marketing involves identifying consumers' needs. So you go out to the market, you try to identify what are the consumers' needs, and you create your marketing strategy to respond to those needs. But within bond marketing, actually consumers are coming themselves, they provide the information. For instance, when we are, you are in a, on a search engine, say looking for shoes or any other product, businesses can track your information and can establish your profile. We, we will see that in a, in a couple of seconds. So this is called targeting strategy, that through the internet, businesses today are able to identify potential customers. So it's not like going out and trying to advertise to everybody, hoping that one of them will respond. But actually, you can establish the profile of people that are likely to buy your, your product. And what companies are doing is to classify us, to establish our profiles. So they could use you know, characteristics such as demographics, uh, age, race, uh, your preferred uh, websites, 
the kind of comments you're posting on, say, Facebook, or the kind of pages you like, when they combine all this information, all your online activity, they are able to establish your, your profile and tell exactly what kind of person you are, and they can craft their marketing strategy to respond to the kind of needs a person like you would, re, uh, would need. So what they do is to establish a persona. A persona is a model for a typical customer of my product. So for instance, you can create a persona of um, a busy mom. So through the internet, you look for the age range of the person that you think would buy your product. What kind of activities are they doing? What are their concerns? What are the key st stresses? What are things that make them hectic? What are the purchase drivers? Places to find information. W which kind of sites do they prefer? Do they prefer to go, say, to mother's uh, blogs or those kind of uh, uh, sites? When you are able to collect all this information and create that pers persona or a typical customer of your product, then you can create your marketing strategy to respond to those kind of uh, people. I, I said it in the first lecture, uh, a story that went in, in the Forbes magazine, 2012, I think, that Target was able, uh, Target uh, is a retailer, it's an American retailer that was able to identify a teenager girl who was pregnant before her dad did. And what they did was, what I'm saying now, to be able to identify a profile that through your search activities on their site, they are able to tell what kind of niche you're looking for. And in, in case of Target, they were able to establish whether a person is pregnant and how far the pregnancy is. And from that point, they can send you offers or brochures, catalogs, showing you things that a pregnant woman would need. And this is applied with, by a lot of companies now, they, they are doing. Of course, there are a lot of uh, privacy concerns, but this is what is happening. The, for instance, if you open my private uh, PC and type something like shoes, most likely you will see an advert from Zalando showing shoes. And not just shoes, they will show you Adidas shoes because that is based on my previous activities. They have my information. So they know whenever I'm looking for shoes, if they try to tempt me with their offers, I might fall for that. And they're collecting information of everybody. That's what Google is doing. So why should we care about inbound marketing? Inbound marketing makes a helps companies to save a lot of money on in marketing. This is how marketing used to be in the past, traditional marketing, that you would advertise through billboards, radio, newspapers, television, direct mail. But what's the problem with the traditional marketing? The problems with traditional marketing can be summarized by a quote from John Wanamaker, is a, a, a reputable American maker. So he said, the problem with traditional marketing is half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half is. Another problem is consumers have changed. And traditional marketing is no longer in line with the way consumers engage and buy these days. This is today's customer. They are online, they are on social media platforms, they are looking for, say, re before you, you buy, you book a room, you would like to read reviews of some previous uh, uh, visitors to that hotel. We have a lot of sources of information that can help us to make a, a, a decision. But this is kind of uh, approach is not compatible to the traditional marketing. Digital technologies have made traditional, or we, they, call, they call them interactive marketing, less effective. So television, radio have become less and less popular. Here's an example. 
when you apply traditional marketing, it's like shooting with a shotgun. When you shoot with a shotgun, usually when the bullet is fired, it will open up and the little metallic balls will spread, hoping that one of them will reach the target. So this is what happens when you advertise on a television or in a newspaper or in a billboard. You are hoping that among the people that will come across your ad, one of them will be convinced and buy. But you don't know exactly who that person is. And this is called shotgun marketing, that you're spreading your bullet, hoping that it will hit one of the potential customers. But this is inbound marketing. It's like shooting with a rifle. You have to identify a target because you have only one that piece, uh, solid, me me metallic solid piece that will hit that target. You, you, there is no chance for just pointing to the direction of the target and hoping that one of them will hit. So you have to be very accurate. And this is what internet does today. It helps companies to exactly identify a potential customer by being able to establish our profiles. And this is what they call rifle marketing. Of course, some people criticize inbound marketing. They say when you advertise, say, in a national television, some people may be completely unaware of your product. But because you are exposing it to a large audience, then one of them could become aware and interested in your product. But when we do inbound marketing, it's like we are relying on people that are already interested in a particular product. So for instance, someone is asking, say, is searching for shoes in Google. So that person is already in the process of buying. And then you can tap that information and take advantage of it. But with traditional marketing, you advertise even to people that are not interested. For instance, when we receive uh, reclaim uh, newspaper, this um, catalogs, uh, newspaper, uh, advertising newspapers in our mailboxes, they send it to everybody. They just identify the street and everybody receives it. Some of us would just pick it and take it straight to the dustbin. You don't even bother to, uh, to read it. But with inbound marketing, you are not sending information to people that will not care about your product. So for instance, you ask Google to show your advert only to people that are likely to buy the product. But uh, however, ad advocates of inbound marketing say that's not true. Actually, even inbound marketing has the potential of exposing your message to people that are, are not likely to be your consumers. You guys remember this? That was 2013 in, in December. Where's just Christmas miracle? You go and watch that video. I, I, I didn't know about WestJet uh, before, but it was from this uh, viral video. I knew about it. And a lot of people, if you go down that video and read the comments, there are a lot of people that say this was a very touching experience. For those of you who didn't know, it's like uh, WestJet made a kind of surprise that people that were going to take uh, a flight on that particular route were asked to write down what gift would they like for Christmas. So people chose different uh, objects. So some say television, smartphone, a lot of things. And what, did, uh, what uh, WestJet did was to send that list to, the, to their office in the destination, and they quickly arranged for all those stuff to be bought. So when you were going to pick your luggage, you would also receive the gift that you had said you would like to earn. It was a powerful, uh, amazing. And the video went viral. You can look uh, at the views. 40.4 million views. Among these are people that actually didn't know, like me, didn't know anything about this airline. So advocates of inbound marketing say it's not true that uh, inbound marketing is only focusing on people that are already interested or already know your product. Actually, you can reach even a wider audience depending on how you craft your content. We will talk about content in a couple of minutes.
Oh, this one. Remember this? 77 million. So it's not true that traditional marketing is the only way you can reach people that are not interested or are not aware of your product. It depends on how you craft your strategy. Even within bond marketing, you have the chance of reaching, like increasing awareness of your product or service. So what's the way forward? If the people that are criticizing in bond marketing and those who are criticizing um, traditional marketing, now the increasing trend is companies that are using both social media with traditional media. Like there is a kind of media mix that they are combining both the traditional ways and the digital approaches to, uh, to marketing. If I can draw, This is traditional marketing. So in the past, this is how it used to be. Newspapers, television, billboards were much more popular. And digital approaches were very, were less popular. We didn't know very much. And probably now we are here. But there's a kind of balance, an equilibrium point, in a way, that companies are combining both traditional ways and digital approaches. So one of the ways you can combine is uh, cross-promotion. It's very common these days when you, uh, you, you look at an ad in the television, at the end they will have, uh, say, a hashtag, or they will ask you to follow them on Facebook, and likewise in newspapers. So they are trying to cross-promote their products and services just to link customers across different uh, platforms. But maybe in the past, uh, in the future, this is how it will look like. Because we see that traditional marketing keeps on declining. So most likely that as we keep on proceeding, in the future, they will completely disappear. So what are the pillars of inbound marketing? There are three pillars that inbound marketing relies upon. One is content, search, social media. We say that inbound marketing relies on proactive behavior of consumers who these days tend to, mostly through uh, internet, search for information. And what inbound marketers are doing is to take advantage of that behavior of consumers. And those are the three pillars, as we will discuss each of them in turn. This is, can be regarded as a pool mechanism. A pool mechanism in the sense that with inbound marketing, companies are doing activities that will, able to, will be able to attract consumers to their products, to their size. And one of these approaches is on content marketing, search marketing, and social media marketing. And they're all based on those three pillars that I've just uh, mentioned. That is content, search, and social media. So what is content marketing? Content marketing refers to the management of text, rich media, audio, video, whatever you publish on your, your, your website for the purpose of engaging customers and potential customers in order to reach your organizational goals. So whatever you are doing with your content in order to attract traffic to your online presence, whether it's a website or a blog or a brand community 
for the purpose of engaging your consumers. That's what we call content marketing. Way back in 1996, Bill made a statement that became very popular that content is king. We talked about it uh, briefly uh, last week. It's one of the benefits that people are looking for, and today we will go a little bit more to look at the characteristics of content that can attract consumers to your site. So, there's a lot of information on the internet, right? There's so much to look at. I think at the moment, Google has indexed more than 20 billion pages, which means consumers have no time to look at everything. We are looking for things that are important to us, things that are attractive. So if you have a business and you like to attract traffic to your site, you need to have a kind of content that will be pulling or will be attractive, will be a magnet to your customers. So what are the characteristics of that content? The first characteristic is visual. I think you're, 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 uh, probably you have all heard that expression, a, a picture speaks a, a thousand words, like because the mechanism of human thinking is mostly visually. People can understand better through pictures, through images. So if you want to attract your, uh, consumers to your site, first and foremost, you have to consider as much as possible to represent your information visually. So that could be images, or if it's data, it could be through infographics, uh, summarizing the information through graphs in a way that is attractive, that appeals to your audience. So it's very, visual representation is first and more uh, foremost thing to do. Uh, last week we, we, we saw a couple of uh, websites. We, we looked at uh, Nike uh, website, Audi, and all of them, you could see that the moment you open them, they're intriguing. It's amazing. L they look beautiful. They use a lot of visual representation. Second, shareable. That these days people like, we interact on the internet. We like to share good news, of course, bad news, whatever. But people like to share whatever uh, good you come across uh, on the internet. You would also like your friends, your family to be aware of. So try to make the content on your website shareable. And this could be as simple as including a share button on your site, just to make it possible for people to share the content. And in that way, you can spread the word. If it's uh, a product, then people can share the information about your product easily. So in the past, we had what we call word of mouth. And this is what we have today, word of mouth, right? So people share information online. If you want to have a successful site, you need to make it possible for people to share that content. Make it emotional. And that could be making people laugh or even cry. And according to psychologists, emotional mes me messages last longer than non-emotional messages. So you want to take advantage of that. Make your content emotional so that people can remember it for many, even many years to come. Like the, the WestJet uh, video. I, I just remembered it uh, today, but I've seen so many videos on YouTube. Why do I still remember that? It was still, it was so touching the way the whole thing was crafted. And so many other videos we, we, we see in YouTube that go viral. Usually they have a, they're a bit different from others. They have some qualities that people would like to share with us. So one of the ways you can do that is make it emotional. And could be positive or negative emotional, but it has to be emotional. Make your content interactive, that it should be possible either for consumers to interact between themselves or to interact with your brand and it could be even including some game elements on your website 
or allowing people to accumulate points. Say, if you have a brand community and you, you award your, your consumers points uh, depending on their contribution on the site. Or you can give them status. For instance, if uh, uh, on, your, on your brand community, people are helping each other. If people say you have a, a device and those who buy your devices, from time to time they share their experiences uh, or they help each other in, in case uh, one ex experiences problems. And you award points or some status to, to those who are, you know, they, they are mostly present on the community. That adds a lot of points to your site. So make it interactive. Make it possible for people to, inter to interact between themselves, but as well as to interact with you. Make it unique. As I said, there is so much on the internet today. If you want to be a magnet, it has to be unique because people don't like to go to sites where you know that the original content is somewhere else. If it's you are, say, just copying and pasting from other uh, people's sites, eventually people would like to consult the original source than yours. So try as much as you can to be unique. And this echoes to the point I said in the first lecture about differentiation, that you have to stand out of the crowd. You have to be different because we are living in a competitive society, right? In a competitive economy. So if you want to shine out, you need to be different. You need to be unique in some way. And this is what you want to do to your site. Make the content unique. Make it different from other sites. Be credible. Sometimes you would have information from other sites, either to boost up the, the content on your website, or sometimes you are describing something and you would like uh, to support it with some statistics, some data, and you consult another source. If you do that, acknowledge the source, because credibility is very important. Don't take other people's stuff and claim it to be yours. If it's not yours, state it. And if possible, provide the link that this is where I got the material. Because when consumers find out that what you are posting is not yours, and you are pretend that it belongs to you, your credibility will decline, and they will eventually quit you. Because first, you are not trustworthy. Because if you are taking other people's stuff and you, you don't state it, then it, that implies they cannot even rely on your services or your product because you are the kind of person that is willing to do whatever to make your ends meet. So be credible, acknowledge other people's works. Timely. Your content has to be timely. If it's summertime, then you have to have content that is in line with that uh, season. If it's Christmas time, it has to be in line with that season because usually the way people think, it's much easier for people to tap and appreciate the, no the information you're providing if it matches to what is going on in their minds at that time. So you want to be timely. Your information has to be timely. You don't uh, post things that are out of date. You have to be current. Fun. We like entertainment. Try to make your content as fun as possible. Of course, don't exaggerate it, especially when it comes to business, but make it in a way that people can enjoy it, whether to read or uh, to, to, to view that video, but try to make it as fun as possible. And the last one is relevance. After taking care of all these other factors, in the end, and this is the most important, you have to be relevant. That is, consumers are looking for things that are relevant to them. So your content might be fun, timely, credible, unique, 
visual, shareable, emotional, interactive. If we see relevant, people will not get attracted to it. So try to make it relevant so that people can find it, can find a reason to come to your site. And then the second approach to inbound marketing, and that is search marketing. So these days, as we said earlier, that consumers are so much online. People are looking for information online, whether through their mobile phones, through uh, PC, tablets, tablets, whatever device. But we are looking a lot of information online, which means if you want your products to be visible, you need also to be online. And this is what companies are doing. They are trying to increase their visibility online, that they are making all efforts possible to make sure that we consumers can see them, we can notice them. So search marketing is a marketing approach that involves gaining traffic and visibility from search engines through both paid and unpaid efforts. I, I will explain this in a second. So since consumers are online, companies want to be seen by these consumers. But the competition is tense. Uh, Everybody is there. So how do you overcome the competition? You have to have strategy for increasing your visibility. That when consumers are looking for information about certain products or certain goods, services, they have to see you first. And the approach to do that, right, to, to increase your visibility and attract traffic to your sites is what we call search marketing. And there are two categories of search marketing. In the past, this used to be called search engine marketing, but now it's uh, search marketing. And the, search, the, the expression search marketing encompass two approaches to attracting uh, traffic and increasing visibility. That is search engine optimization and search engine marketing. So what is search engine marketing? This is a process of gaining website traffic by purchasing ads on search engines such as, for example, Google AdWords. So what you do with this is you pay a search engine, say Google, Yahoo, Bing, or any other search engine, so that you can attract traffic to your website through ads. I'll show you the distinction between the two. And these are different uh, terms that are used to express search engine marketing. These are Pay search ads, pay search advertising, pay per click. But sometimes all these uh, search engines, uh, the Google, Bing, Yahoo, they have primary results that when you enter a search word in a search engine, usually there will be results. And the, the way the algorithm of the search engine works is they will provide you with links that they think is more relevant given the search word that you have entered. So those primary uh, search results are what we call organic or natural results. So whenever you enter a word in Google, something will pop up. That's natural. Now, what search engine does is, is to attract traffic and increase your visibility through natural or organic search results. So the difference between the two, search engine optimization and search engine marketing. With search engine marketing, you pay a search engine so that when people enter certain words, search, certain search words, then your website should show first. With search engine organization, Oh, sorry, search engine optimization, what you do is you are doing some kind of activities that I, I will show you how to do that so that when people enter search, uh, certain search words, 
your products or your website will come first. Now we, we, we can try to, to, to do this uh, practically and then see how, how, how it works. So suppose we search for shoes. I use the um, school, the, the Norwegian for shoes for international students, and I'll, I'll tell you why I, I, I use the Norwegian word for shoes and not English word, just in a couple of seconds. So when you look at these results, whenever you enter shoes, you'll see ads. These are companies that have paid Google so that whenever someone enters a certain search word that is relevant to their products, then their size should show first. So whenever I enter the word shoes, then Google knows that most likely I am looking for shoes. I'm interested in buying shoes. So immediately they propose to me different service uh, enterprises that can offer that product. So immediately you have, uh, they have sale on shoes 50%, shoes from 129 kroner, and then you have online store, Brandos, Zalando, those are the companies that have paid. But also, besides this, there are organic results. from here. These are companies that have not paid Google for that, but Google believes these are, could also be relevant based on my search word. So they provide me with this link as well. Now, this is what we call search engine marketing, that you deliberately pay a search engine so that they can increase your visibility on the net for the relevant search words. And the other one is search engine optimization, that there are kind of things you do that are, I, I will show you, like how to make your site uh, more visible, so that whenever people enter certain uh, search words that are relevant to your service or your uh, good, then the, your link or your site should come first. Uh, I, I said I'll tell you why I, um, I use the school. Now, w usually when you pay for, for this um, paid search, for instance, when you pay for the AdWords, you tell Google what kind of people you, you want to be reached by this, uh, uh, the ad, right? So you can tell them that I don't want my, either by location, that my ad should only be visible, say, in Norway. You can tell them by language that my, my ad should only be visible by people that are using Norwegian or Spanish version of uh, Google. You can even identify IP address, internet protocol address, that I don't want these people to get exposed to my ad. And that is based on your research, that you know who are the relevant uh, uh, potential customers for your product. So if, for instance, we say shoes, all the ads have disappeared, and you still have only this. Even the Zalando is not there, right? And this happens because you will normally tell Google in advance that these are possible search words that I want uh, to show up whatever people are searching for. So you can exclude who, who is your target market. Uh, three o'clock, so probably we should take a break and continue in the next uh, half.